Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the RSM's COVID-19 series. Now then, those of you with good memories 13 months ago may remember episode 12 of this series when we spoke to Jenny Harris, the time when she was deputy CMO. Um, 13 months have passed now. This is now episode 78, um, and we have Jenny back with us. Um, so Jenny, since we last spoke, um, anything much been going on? No, I'm only joking. I'm only teasing you. I'm only teasing you. But uh, uh, you've massive things have been going on. And just to remind our audience that you have a vast experience in public health. You've been on JCBI, one of those organizations everyone now knows about, but no one knew about in the past for at least 10 years. You became deputy CMO just before the sky fell in. And now you've got a new job. You are the new chief executive of the UK Health Security Agency, or UXA, as I believe we're starting to call it. But we're going to, before we get to that, we love to be topical on this program. So we, according to the news today, um, we're now part of a new, a new Atlantic Charter signed between Boris and uh, Joe Biden. And um, the government website this morning says its principal task will be building back coronavirus, from coronavirus, sorry, hopefully not building the virus back, <laughs> and uh, supporting the world to bring an end to and recover from the coronavirus pandemic. Well, that's kind of your job, isn't it? So what, what, what's the news today that you can tell us? Uh, so, yes, good afternoon, Simon and, and everybody online. A absolutely. It's been a really busy year. Um, <laughs> and yes, I'm sitting here as the new chief executive of the UK Health Security Agency. And I think what the announcement today is, and, and I just encourage people more, more excitement and detail at 4.15, which I can't quite divulge yet, uh, but uh, very much working with the US um, as uh, hopefully global exemplars in um, uh, global surveillance of pandemics, uh, risk and preparedness as we go forward. And that's going to be building on all of the great success we've had with uh, genomic surveillance and um, uh, data utilisation in this country. So it's a really important time. And I, th I think also just to flag underneath that is a real commitment to um, the inequalities of gender in relation to health protection as well, which I'm sh I know you're very passionate about too. Is that, and can you give any clues as to, I mean, we've already got lots of global commitments, haven't we? We're linked with the WHO in a huge way, CDC, et cetera. Is this going to some, su supplant some of our existing collaborations or this is in addition to, can you? Can well, you yeah, pe people, people like the word turbo boost recently. And I think I'd, I'd use that. I think, it's, I think it's turbo boosting our input. But I mean, clearly what the pandemic has done has really shown uh, exactly what everybody says, that infection knows no borders. And we are a, a, a global universe now where people travel frequently across borders. And uh, as one of my scientific colleagues said, you can't hermetically seal them. Uh, so it is really important that we all work together to prevent uh, the risks around rising in the first place and where they do that we manage them very rapidly and responsively and jointly and I think what uh, the the announcements today will be is very much about um, a commitment to protect our own countries obviously I'm now uh, part of the UK Health Security Agency to keep the UK safe but there is a commitment in that globally to support the rest of the world in helping them uh, to keep their own countries safe as well and, and we have done this sort of thing before PHE for example has done fantastic work on supporting uh, international health regulation compliance and building capacity. But I think this is moving the new organisation into a completely different uh, global sphere of operation um, and very much an ambition to be a global exemplar. OK, so you've, you've raised about the three topics that we're certain to cover. Um, what's happened to PH, PHE and how those good things being kept, uh, our the borders and, of course, the big decision that you're involved in in the coming days. But first of all, sketch out the landscape a bit for us, because I have to say, it is a bit complicated. You're the head of these, or what do we would call it, health security, HEXR, HEX, or whatever we're going to call it. That's clear. Um, and you report to whom? You report to the Secretary of State? Is that, that the new structure? Yeah, so, so technically, and this has come as quite a shock to me as a, as a medic, I find myself a second permanent secretary yeah. in, in the Department of, of Health, which is uh, not, not at all a planned move, but very much driven by a desire to get public health done in a really practical way. Um, so uh, the, the landscape really is... Public Health England uh, was there previously, which and still is until the 1st of October. Um, uh, in the pandemic, uh, in order to manage the um, scale 
uh, and capability that really wasn't there, I think, at the start of the pandemic to respond. Uh, we had uh, test and trace built uh, to do testing and tracing, the clues in the title, and then the Joint Biosecurity Centre, which was collating and pulling in, analysing and um, and distributing in, in a useful way, I think, the data relating to the pandemic. Um, and so it's really pulling in those three features, Joint Biosecurity Centre, Data and Analytics, uh, Test and Trace, and then all the uh, brilliant scientific skills that sit within Public Health England, and of course, all of the capacity as well of their local health protection teams and their global rapid support team as well. Okay, so let's pick up a couple of points. Now, some of this, you know, Joint Biosecurity Centre sounds quite similar to JTAC, you know, the Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre. Um, the first, the, the head, Claire Gardner, very distinguished woman over from GCHQ, um, was the first head. I'm, I'm not sure if she still is, actually, but she certainly was the first. Um, it, there's a bit of a touch of spooks there, isn't there? And, and you know, <laughs> national security agencies, et cetera. You, is, is that kind of the you know, the, the image you want to be projecting here, because it's it's got its downside. It, it has, although I have to admit, I hadn't put on my list of characteristics the sort of spooky security side, so no. I might have to change <laughs> but. my character. Um, but I think... I mean, you're, you're quite right. I mean, many people will know that when the uh, concept was initially devised, the... Um, the, the working title for development was the National Institute of Health Protection. And I think what that signaled is the key, uh, key architecture, key purpose, which is around a laser focus on health protection and a science-led organisation. But um, the health security agency, I, I translate in two ways. So I think when you talk of it at a global level, I say global to local, UK health security agency moves the organization right up into the same national infrastructure and importance uh, as things like uh, GCHQ and, and various other bits of our, our security system and really flagged how important health is to our population and to our economy as we've seen as well. But if you turn that round and I go and sit perhaps with my old director of public health hat on or as a GP out in a community, I think that the phrasing there I would change round and I would say it's an organisation to help keep communities secure and, and working with local authorities, working with directors of public health and uh, through ICS's GPs um, and local services. Okay, now my laptop has decided that it won't print the letter L, so I've copied over a question that, that says um, uh, about benefiting from the analytic skis of the JBA, which I think is skills, but it does... Skills, hopefully. We, we don't have skills, any skills, yeah. I can assure you, yes. But I mean, there, I mean, again, how can you? I mean, obviously, there are they have massive analytic skills, etc. But is there something you can say slightly reassuring to people who develop antibodies um, when it comes to analytic skills, data sharing, you know, um, cyber resilience, and 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 uh, you know, somebody moved over from GCHQ? Is there something you can say that just to remind people that this is not, um, you know, this is not a journey into the dark side? No, uh, absolutely not a journey into the dark side. And you you mentioned Claire Gardner there, and she has actually just left. We're just in the yeah. process of uh, a, new, yeah. a new permanent um, uh, director for the the analytics unit. But I mean, analytics is is about learning from the data. Actually, it's it's not necessarily it's it's processing it in a way. It's for public health. What you want is is a data information for action. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that. We collect data and we don't use it. So the real purpose of the JBC is about collecting often existing streams of information and not necessarily personalised, which I think you're, uh, you're alluding to. Yeah. Um, so for example, wastewater, I can absolutely assure you, I do not know, uh, and excuse the sort of the, the vision of this, but you know, whose feces it is we collect the viral sample from in particular Particular. What I would know is broadly which wastewater stream it had come from, and therefore we have a pretty good idea of whether there is any continuing or beginning to be um, a, a new variant in a particular area. Now, those are quite broad ones, but you can see that combining that, for example, with following surge testing in an area where we think we've overcome um, a local outbreak is a really helpful way of doing it. That's not impinging on anybody's individual data at 
all. But the, the JBC actually, one of the things it's been really good at, and I'm hoping we will take forward, is not necessarily in collecting primary data, which would be an individual personalised one, but is pulling together uh, local data and uh, visualising it, laying it on top of each other to build up a real picture of what infection is like in a community, for example, or we can see uh, transits through travel routes, so uh, routes where people go to work up and down a, a motorway corridor. So it gives us a great deal of insight into how we can best support uh, local populations to tackle uh, coronavirus and obviously in due course other infectious diseases and health hazards. Okay, so could, we've got a, a, a reasonable question, uh, well, we've got lots of reasonable questions, but one picking up from Nadia Wells, who obviously we're going to be talking about corona, but could you just say, what, what is the full scope of the threats that the new agency is going to be preparing and protecting us from? And what are the threats that it isn't going to be? I, that's me adding on. Um, so I think obviously people would entirely expect in the current climate for us to be absolutely focused on COVID and, and yes. we will but, but people also need to remember that in the background, Public Health England um, is, is sitting doing business as usual all the way through this. So if you've had you know, a case of meningitis in your patch or whatever else it might be, all of the routine health protection work has been going on completely to their credit that none of that has been dropped despite coronavirus. Um, you know, we, we have a number of different diseases and high level, you know, high, high consequence infectious diseases, which get dealt with every now and again. And it's really important we maintain those services. So I think what's in, in remit is infectious disease, you can imagine. So it will continue to do all the things it used to, things like TB, uh, things like um, outbreaks, you know, supporting uh, uh, local care homes and health se sector to respond to norovirus, all those sorts of normal things. Immunisation uh, and promoting that going forward, childhood immunisations, that all continues. Um, PHE also had uh, a surveillance system for overseas uh, disease. So if we think back to Ebola outbreaks, those sorts of strands of information come in all the time. And there is a UK uh, public health rapid support team, which gets sent out often to sort support work with yeah. WHO. Um, so all of that will continue. I think the bit that perhaps we will be uh, increasing a little bit are things, um, the CRC elements, so the chemical radiation uh, um, uh, uh, nuclear element. Uh, there is again a small core of staff who do that, but I think a, a lots of opportunity going forward. And then obviously that leads into environmental health, so the health impacts of environmental health and some parts of the air quality agenda as well. So I think it's any any health hazard, uh, external health hazard, uh, but particularly focused on infectious diseases to start with. Okay. Now lots of people, too many to list. Obviously want to know about the current situation. Now you've, uh, you've come in at a very quiet time, haven't you? Ha, I made that joke already, but it's still the case. And you're immediately gonna be part of the big decision coming up on June the 21st. Do we steady as we go? Do we keep progressing? Do we even step backwards? So on May 24, you said you were looking forward to proceeding uh, as per the roadmap. And then four days later, you were raising concerns. Um, where, come on, where are we now then? another 10 days have passed where so, are we? Uh, so we are we are progressing and probably as a country not quite in the right direction that we'd all want to um, and I think it's really important why everybody does keep focused on the data the the roadmap was built with five week periods and that's to uh, a weekly way almost to implement or take away something to see where it happens because it takes time to, for the change to happen and then a two week for cases to turn to uh, uh, hospitalisation, if you like, and two weeks into fatalities. So when when you're actually looking at cases moving, you need, that's an absolute minimum time period to see what is happening epidemiologically. And of course, what has happened is we have had uh, some cases of the Delta variant and in places like Bolton, for example, actually, they have done magnificent work in, in trying to uh, suppress uh, some of these outbreaks and in many areas. So Sefton, for example, they had had an outbreak and managed to quell it down completely. But we definitely do have increased transmissibility in that variant, as we saw perhaps with the uh, uh, the what was uh, the the variant arising in Kent previously, now the Alpha variant. Mm. Um, and uh, so all of the 
the numbers are rising. They're still very small numbers in totality of cases, but you'll probably have seen yesterday we had a thousand uh, inpatients. Um, I, I think the important thing is here, this really is an knife edge decision point because mm -hmm. the cases are rising and I think that's becoming clearer. Uh, and modelling does suggest that we would start to see a further rise, not necessarily immediately, but in coming weeks. But one of the critical things here is understanding the vaccine effectiveness. Um, and because we've had very few numbers through, the robustness of the interpretation of the data on that is really quite tricky. So PHE are literally working on that as we speak to understand. And it's very clear, if you look at the data, the sort of 60-year-old age group are generally just not getting ill. They're, these are the doubly vaccinated individuals with high vaccine uptake. Are, are re, they're appearing in hospital, but usually unvaccinated or with just having had a single dose. So key message, make sure everybody gets two doses. Um, and that is clearly having an impact, but quite what the size of the impact will be is the bit that we're still waiting on. And, and it will be another week. And I, I know you're having... Um, uh, a colleague in from Sage next week, who who is one of the one of the individuals who is absolutely looking at that, and himself was saying we need one more week to look. So we're waiting for a week. Is the short answer, Simon? Okay, that that's Graham Medley and Neil Ferguson are coming next. That's right. Week. Graham, so, uh, Graham was online yesterday. Yeah, Graham and and well, Neil isn't on Sage, but I'm I'm sure he's still very well connected there. Um, so, okay, so let, let let's let's look at this in a little bit more detail now. I'm quite in, very interested in, in, in the fact that, uh, you know, La Lancashire is changing all its colours all for the bad at the moment. I think so even Sefton actually seems to have relapsed a little bit uh, mm. uh, 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 there. But um, what, it, it's curious, isn't it, is sitting here in London, as I do in South London, do I face a bigger threat from Lisbon or from Lancashire? And at the moment, it seems that I face a bigger threat if I'm concerned about catching uh, the virus from Lancashire uh, rather than Lisbon. But it's Lisbon that we've been, you know, we shut down along with Lausanne and Lyon and lots of other places. Lancashire, um, it, it's, it's a warning, no more than that, um, not to travel there or back. But we haven't blocked the M62 or the M6 or anything like that, as they've done in Australia, as they've done in France, they've done in Austria. Um, we're doing, we'll talk about what measures they're doing inside Lancashire, but wh why are we, why do you think we are just so reluctant to simply block travel from a particular area that is going through a crisis at the moment? Yeah, I, I think it is. I, I mean, we are at a different stage of our understanding of the uh, of the virus itself. And I mean, I would just flag at this point the fact that we have such detailed information about variants. We know which one, you know, that the alpha is going down and the delta is going up yeah. is just phenomenal. We could not have done this even six months ago and certainly not in the time frame where we're almost we're nearly getting to real time data. Not quite. But, you know, it's, it's a week, 10 days around. But you can see these changes. Um, and I think. It's a much wider concept than just saying uh, shut it down. There are obviously issues about tolerability, but there are obviously issues around much broader ones about how people live their lives and whether it is sustainable or not. And certainly where you and, and also, of course, where where the virus may have spread to start with. Um, as with all of the pandemic, it is very much a relationship, I think, between uh, civil society, scientists, the virus. It just isn't as simple as cutting down. And in fact, if you look at um, the the situation, for example, somewhere like Australia, their, their whole land masses are very different, I think, to the way that they are in the UK. We are, and this applies to international travel as much as it does internally, we are an international hub. Uh, we have a lot of requirements set on uh, stuff coming in and out, as well as people of the country. Um, and certainly for the areas which uh, Lancashire, for example, I mean, one of the things which is so critical from a public health perspective is some of these areas have actually been shut down for months through the worst phase of the pandemic. So taking a decision uh, Potentially, and I'm not saying this is the case because we're waiting for the data, but while we have a variant which does not seem to be uh, impacting on, on hospitalizations and deaths, it's mostly affecting younger people, uh, and yet shutting down 
for example, employment, travel, connections, it's not as simple as it perhaps seems from outside. For example, you know, if you have a, a residential care setting where individuals need caring for and their lives will be at risk without that, do you stop your carers wandering down the M62 to, to go and help them? So it, they are major decisions which, I mean, ultimately lie with the politicians and we do our very best to try and provide all the right data, including things like mobility data, for example, which does come through JBC as well. Okay, I mean, I mean, obviously, Brian, it isn't your it isn't your decision. We know that, but you are there to, to offer advice. But could you just explain what you mean? You said that Bolton has done a, a, a good job, and and it clearly is. You know, it, it, the rates are going down there, and Bedford as well. So, what is it that they're doing right then? So, um, so I don't think it's that anybody's done anything wrong. Is a really okay. important. Thing because I, I do feel very strongly there are so many areas, particularly around Lancashire, around Greater Manchester, parts of Yorkshire and Humber previously, where people have really, really worked hard, uh, both the professionals, but particularly local communities, to try and keep themselves all safe. So I think that's a really important message. But I think uh, in Bolton, that was the first um, major site, if you like, of the uh, of the Delta variant. Um, and uh, it was it wasn't a lockdown area it was actually a supported area and I think that's important as well because the additional support is very much welcomed in a positive way by local communities who worked really hard with local professionals very very rapid uptake of um, testing which was really good to identify where there were potential chains of transmission uh, support from from the army but I think also we have um, a rapid support team that goes out now into communities and helps we are much more agile on the test and trace side at popping up mobile testing units where they're needed literally I mean I come into this job and I, I do just want to call out to my testing colleagues here because I was sitting outside it before and the logistics is phenomenal I say can I have a mobile testing unit there they say yes and there it is functioning linking with uh, local authorities and directors of public health as well so I think really really good work the other thing is that actually in many of these areas there have been some uh, under vaccinated populations so people less confident to come forward and it's not that the vaccination will control an outbreak in the immediate short term that's not the right message but actually what it will likely do is protect communities and once they are concerned about something it may be that their risk perception is more that says actually I feel a bit more confident this is something I'd like to have now so I think working with NHS colleagues in local areas to do both those things to test to trace um, and to uh, and to ensure people have maximum opportunity for vaccination as well has been really successful. But I, I think you, you know we're going to have to see how it goes because it has dropped really successfully, but it is plateaued. And I think there is a little indication that just like the rest of the country, it may start to dip up again shortly. What we're talking about places like Bolton and Bedford again. Bolton. Yes. So I think, again, um, but we're doing we are actually actively looking at the eight areas that uh, yes. were first strongly supported. We're doing a piece of work, see what we can learn and share with others. OK, fair enough. Um, and I take your point about the, the vaccines, is, e even if that's not going to have the immediate effect. But this is an opportunity um, to get, play the medium term game of getting absolutely everybody vaccinated. And, and, and no one's going to disagree with that. It does seem we're a bit short at the moment, aren't we, though, Jenny? I mean, we had we were doing something like 700,000 a day, but that's clearly dropped. Um, is, is that, I, mean, I assume we're using all the supply we can get. Is, is that yep. just, yep. So we would prefer to be doing more? Yeah, so, so obviously, um, I, I mean, NHS has done a fabulous job. Um, I, I expect many of the people on this call have been working really hard to deliver those vaccination programmes. Um, and, and we are just supply dependent. Um, and, and it's one of the things, I think one of the reasons the programme has been so successful is that we have had this consistent rollout. And so if there are, if there's vaccine available, out it goes. Um, and, uh, and and it gets halted a little bit by the, the flows going through. But nevertheless, the amount of vaccination which is ongoing now is a very significant rollout yes. and, and really successful. I, I think there is, there's there been a little bit of a debate, and I'm sure people will have seen in the papers about whether we should be vaccinating 
younger people um, in, in these areas particularly. Um, and uh, as, as when there is more vaccine available, then obviously some of these debates go away. But because of the rise in hospitalizations and the risk that there may be a wider spread of, of the Delta variant, it is really primarily important for saving lives that the older uh, individuals who are more at risk, who have not had first and, def and second vaccinations, maximally get vaccinated. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I think we're going to defer questions on, on the younger ones because we'll be having a, a, a special um, session, particularly on uh, vaccinating the under 18s. But but your point is the as ever. I mean, the coverage is incredibly high in the elderly, but it still could be a bit higher, particularly. There are pockets, I think, Simon. Pockets. And, and what the the Bolton approach does is allows work with local authorities who know where those pockets of the communities yeah. are to work with, for example, local faith leaders or people who are trusted to uh, give messages out or to provide information in a way which people find easy to understand. Yeah. And And often it's not about translating a piece of paper that's not what it is it's about fitting the vaccination program into the context of people's lives and I think that's why it's been so successful in Bolton yeah again and well done now now you mentioned test and trace quite a lot now what for whatever reason it's not had a great press as you know and um, so someone's said uh, what are you going to do to improve it or probably I think uh, uh, I'd prefer to change uh, this is Mr Reid but what I want to ask is what are you going to do to restore confidence in the test and trace system whether fair or unfair we don't want to get into but there is a lack of trust and confidence in the system sadly and you're in charge of it now what are you going to do to change that it's, it's a really interesting question and it's one that i uh, answered at my interview actually no. so i hope i've got a good answer for it um i absolutely recognize the problem and i think for the health security agency particularly with our title as you said it is really important that the public trust us um i don't want to be a distant organization we need to work with them and i think there are a number of ways of doing that one of the things which the organization has done in in recent months and perhaps I think we could have done a little bit earlier is to work I work with local authorities and with directors of public health and I might say that because that's my background but my intention is very much to what I call swivel the service and that's not just for now but that is for the future as well I think what we need is to remember that the basic model of health protection has always been and has generally worked very well is with the local director of public health and the local health protection team um, and local health services the difficulty here was the scalability of the operation so i think we we swivel it round we turn and we have done already turned our community tracing services into what we call uh, local o's so these are primarily director of public health led um, and we work with them to do that. And I think one of the successes there is that uh, after a little bit of a sticky swivel round, uh, what we find then is that directors of public health and their local teams uh, and local authorities will know how to uh, contact and how to work with families who may not otherwise have come forward. I think that's one of the important things. I think there is a communication issue as well. Um, so I'm on a bit of a, oh, I'm, on, I'm on your programme now, but I, I intend to pick up lots of proactive media because uh, my perspective was that test and trace somehow wasn't hasn't been able to um, to explain things very easily before it's been on a firing line um, and I think it has done some brilliant work and one of the problems I find is of course we've got very large numbers of staff who step forward whether in centrally or or in testing and tracing centres um, and they're doing a fabulous job and, and they often get a negative press and I, I was up in um, in uh, Derbyshire uh, last week um, and the staff at the local uh, test centre are just so proud of what they do and they should rightly be so. So I think where, where you get a direct public engagement with the service is actually the report is very, very strong. Um, and I think we just need to get the facts out about the service and work with the public um, uh, and, and swivel it round to, to fit into their way, you know, their, their daily lives actually. Okay, and say a word about uh, PHE um, in, in the sense, I mean, I, I suppose the question I'm really asking you is, um, 
well, two things. One, one, just remind us what what were its strengths and successes. And and second, I guess the question is, did do you think that it had to go? Do you, it's going to go in October. Do you think that was? I mean, you may not be able to answer this. So I'm going to ask you anyway. What what? <laughs> So to say something about PHE and what it's done well, but why the new system will be better. So probably ought to declare at the start and you will know, but of yes. course I was the deputy uh, medical director at PHE and the regional director <laughs> in before the DCMO role. So mm. I know the inside of PHE very well. And I think, uh, you know, and a really important point, when you hear really good stuff, you know, we talk about the genomics events, mm -hmm. uh, recognising uh, other, you know, Sanger Institute and COG UK and various others. But the um, it's the PHE scientists and the local health protection teams who are really driving much of the brilliant response to the pandemic. And I think we absolutely have to recognise that. So there are lots of excellent bits. I think the problem has been, my view is, uh, the health protection side was not noisy enough. Um, I would like to think that having a professional leader who's worked in health protection will enable those staff to have their work shown and visible to the world in a really positive way that it should be. Um, and that the health security agency will, will allow that prominence actually in, in the global space. It's really interesting because, you know, when WHO, for example, uh, wanted uh, um, scenario teaching in a different country about emergency response, they would call on the Public Health England team. Not many people know that. Um, you know, when we have cases of uh, monkeypox or we look at the Novichok response, it's those scientists who are who are working on these cases um, and they do fabulous work. But I don't think they're quite noisy enough about it. Um, and I'm hoping to enable them to be really ambitious and actually really get that work out onto the public stage. And then and then there can be a fair judgment, I think, of the contribution that the organisation makes. I mean, and obviously those, those are great objectives, but there is one slight barrier to that. As you've said, you are now Sir Humphrey. As you said, you, you, you use the phrase, you, well, I use that phrase, but you're, you're now a perm sec, you're now a civil servant. How are you going to balance that role, but still being a public health person? You're still a doctor, you're still on the register, you still have the duties of a doctor. You know, you're a bit of both. Um, aren't there going to be some situations where you're going to be torn in two ways? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, in some ways, but of course there are many others like me. So CMO for a start, my previous role was exactly the same. And I think uh, the biggest problem is persuading uh, colleagues that actually you don't suddenly change in your own moral purpose and your own red lines just because you take on a different title. I, I remember when I became deputy CMO, actually, that uh, I was in a, a meeting with a number of directors of public health and they said, well, how can you possibly do that now? Brackets, you've gone over to the dark side. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think they are now suitably reassured. We have a very good working relationship. Uh, they know I will give them a call if there are things uh, going on and we can help each other for the right public health outcomes. Um, and, and actually, if the going gets tough, I know exactly where my red lines are. I have actually never had to cross them. I think the key point is you understand what your role is. You do it to the best of your ability professionally. I'm on the GMC register and I could never propose something uh, or agree to something which I thought was going to be definitively harmful to an individual or a population. Uh, and so the, the point is you, you give your information. Uh, in, if you are in the civil service, ultimately, your responsibility is to give the right um, and accurate information, and then it is for ministers to take the decision. Uh, and I, I think it works well. And, and actually, for me, the really important thing about this is, and going back to your previous question, I think PHE was too far away from ministerial decisions to influence. Um, my approach is to be very loud and noisy around the table and be able to put in what we need to do. So this is the LBJ question. You better inside the tent pissing out, isn't that the... Isn't that the phrase he used? I try to, to phrase it slightly more delicately than that. I think time. you should, but but I think that is the point you're making, definitely. Now, uh, other people have been asking, both before and during. Now, we've we've also got another player here, the Office for Health Promotion, and I, I was always taught there's a kind of a public health, you know, classic bit of of um, teaching or dogma or or whatever is that you bring together always promotion and prevention 
go hand in hand, not under separate rooms. Now I'm thinking of the example of mental health, uh, which has been split this way, but it isn't just mental health. It, isn't there a danger that that, that may, you know, that may not be a good split uh, that, that has now come about and that, it, that at some stage we need to be putting promotion and prevention back together, not under the separate roofs. So, I mean, obviously the design of Public Health England was to try and bring everything together, yes. um, has its benefits for the reason that you've said, but it, it actually sometimes means that things aren't focused on. So I think there isn't, there isn't a, a right answer. Um, and if you look around the world, different institutes have applied either a whole model and then split into separate ones. For me, the key is not to do with organisational boundaries. It's about how you work across them. And I think the Health Security Agency will allow the um, scientific uh, and technical element. And I might also say, you know, that the, the data and infrastructure elements to um, to flourish. But it doesn't mean that we will be forgetful of those critical other health uh, impacts. So um, in the, we're just doing the design work, but certainly on my top table, I am a director of uh, health equity, for example, and it is to keep the organization absolutely focused on the issues of uh, ethnicity, of age, uh, of protected populations, whatever it might be. Um, and I'll be working with CMO who will be heading up the Office of Health Promotion professionally as well. Okay. I have got rid of my dog, but unfortunately you haven't got rid of my phone. So that was what that was. God knows what that is. So a couple more areas people want to cover. Well, I'll do them fairly swiftly. But first is, um, and this does come under, under your remit, is um, the shape of the vaccine program in future. And this is about, it's likely we're going to uh, be needing booster doses. Um, can you say a bit more as to where you think um, that who is going to need it, everyone or just some? And the other question, a perfectly good one, is there now a case for if you received as your prime for, for a second one particular vaccine, is there now a really good argument developing to actually changing that? So next time you would get AZ or Pfizer or whatever, some well, a different class of vaccine. How, how are you so, how's the thinking going on that? I'm, I might be quite disappointing in my answer here, Sam, because actually <laughs> many of those discussions are actually the ones that are ongoing at the moment and obviously quite critical. Right. Um, I think if you the, the vaccine effectiveness data, obviously from the against the Delta variant is is a really key indicator as to uh, what's happening at the moment and what we might need going for, further forward. Um, I'm feeling very confident that we will need some sort of autumn booster. The interplay between the different types of vaccine, I think, is important. But I think the opportunity that we have ahead, uh, and that work is ongoing, is exactly through the where we started with the Health Security Agency working globally on the surveillance programmes, understanding uh, the, um, the characteristics of new emerging viral diseases and actually building capacity to fast track that through to very specific vaccines so that rather than have um, a very long time frame to do this, we can almost generate an off the shelf, slightly tweaked version mm. uh, for, for a new disease coming through. So I think there are two elements. Yes, we're in the sort of mid phase for that now, I think. So definitely work in progress for booster in the autumn, um, but obviously subject to JCVI guidance. It's not just as simple as saying we'll all do this because we, we need to understand how long the previous one works. Um, Clearly, I think still it's the elderly who most need uh, protecting uh, yeah. for all of the things that we've seen. Uh, but equally, it's those who are most protected currently because of the vaccine rollout. OK, so uh, so there will be something, but it's not quite clear what it will be. Um, but we can expect, you know, boosters in the autumn. And it's possible that we will be having a slightly different programme, I think is what you're saying. But it's not clear yet quite how that will be. OK, now. I want to pick up one last point, really. This is coming from Chris Hobson, you know, the, the head of NHS providers, who does a useful service in, in, in uh, passing on what's happening on the ground. And um, this is a question he's actually asked on Twitter, but I'm just going to ask it now anyway. Now, and the thing is this, that most people now, and, and when Chris Whitty was on the programme a few weeks ago, he said this very specifically and openly, accept that COVID is here to stay. OK, that's, that's the point we're at. So I just want to see now we're, we're where we are now in mid-June, um, how will we know when we've reached the point where we no longer try 
and, contro and control the spread of the virus. And when Chris is asking for basically a debate that we get into the influenza situation, not that they're the same, where we have got some form of balancing act between the prevention of mortality and uh, the prevention of all the harms and detriments uh, that come with the program. So where, where have we got to on that? Where do you think we will kind of say, okay, this is now, we're in a steady state, endemic situation. Where, how would we know? Yeah, so um, I'm absolutely with Chris on the, the overall picture. I mean, uh, it's not going to go away and it's here to stay. Um, yeah. We are still, to my mind, and this is a personal view, we're still too early in that process because we do, despite a brilliant vaccination programme, we have two problems. One is uh, we know there is a drop off uh, in vaccine effectiveness albeit it's still protecting, it appears, from serious illness and, and fatality um, in, uh, with new variants, and we need to understand that more. And I think, importantly, we still have a large proportion of the population, so children and young people are around 25%, so uh, we, just very broadly. So we know that there is still a large reservoir of individuals who can become infected and transmit infection. And, of course, that's exactly where we were with uh, influenza. If we go back prior to uh, childhood vaccination there. So um, I think there is both a clinical scientific component to this and a societal one as well. Uh, so I don't think it's just for us to, to decide when it is. It feels a little bit early. I think if we understand this is the first variant, I think, where we've seen the variant come, people understand they're on their way and they will continue to develop. Most of them do nothing at all, and we need to work out which ones are variants of concern. And then this is the very first one where we have a largely vaccinated population and we can see how confident we are that we are on top of the variant rather than the other way around. Now, I think if that happens again and we are also confident in our ability to boost or to develop vaccines very rapidly, then we're starting to move to this phase where we say, actually, endonist doesn't is not not going to affect us in our daily lives we'll work through it but but i think it's also important to remember that you know there are thousands of deaths with flu each year um and probably we need to go back and revisit what our societal view is of that as well now people's minds have been opened to the impact of uh, seasonal respiratory viruses as well okay and that, that i get that and Last thing then, obviously quite a few people are looking to the summer and, and wondering about holidays and trips, et cetera, et cetera. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So on, on the travel issues, uh, one is a very straightforward question, which is Ronnie Odegami has asked, which is why is NHS testing not acceptable for travel purposes? When it is it was acceptable for me to go to the cup final, that was good, but it wasn't acceptable should I want to travel abroad. What, is that just simply money or what? So, so it's not that it's not acceptable in the sense of standards. And in fact, the NHS uh, is, is setting PHE at uh, Porton Down, monitor the standards of tests, and there's a list of those that are acceptable. So uh, quality, absolutely fine. So we take that one off the agenda. Okay. But, um, but, but obviously, people are uh, generally travelling abroad for, uh, for holidays, hopefully not too many at the moment. But, you know, where travel is there, um, it, it's not a requirement in general, um, and therefore it is perceived to be part Part of the travel journey um, and and obviously we need to uh, we still have uh, supply demand issues uh, relating to testing we've got lots of it but we need to monitor those and predict them very carefully um, and uh, we we can't always predict how many people will decide they're going to go off to a particular country on a particular day so I think there are, there are practical reasons but the broad principle is if you're heading off abroad a, a um, and, and again, just to re-emphasise, that should not be to uh, routinely to any country other than green, um, that that is part of the package of travelling abroad. It's not part of the NHS supply. Okay. All right. Well, that's your answer, Ronnie. Sorry. T tough, but... Uh... <laughs> very high quality, Simon. Absolutely no, no, nothing wrong quality. with the quality. Just get that okay. one across. I got that bit, yeah. I mean, it does, I don't know, it does even, I mean, one could, if one was doing, you know, a different programme, say that because we got no uh, points in Eurovision, we're, we're determined to make sure that Europe gets no tourists in return. But I'm sure that's not fair and, and terribly cynical. But it does feel a little bit like that um, at the moment. That we're not, you know, Granada hasn't had any cases since February, but seems to be forever amber. Politics play a part? 
that's the question. So my standard question, but answer, but it is absolutely genuine. Is you can see what the um, methodology is for assessing different countries. JBC do this; they put forward the the data. I think if you go back and look at what happened with the six one, uh, sorry, with the one one seven, the the variant that uh, arose originally identified in Kent. Um, most European countries at the moment have not had sharp rises in the Delta variant. Um, it's quite possible, depending on their levels of vaccination, which is one of the things which, of course, is in the JBC methodology, uh, that many of those European countries may well have seeded cases now and will start to rise. So I think that methodology is very broad. It looks at both the cases, the positivity, but importantly, the certainty that we have in the country detecting uh, new variants and cases at the time. So it's about the sampling in the population as well. So it's, it's not just one one issue. It is about a whole panoply of different indicators and, and they are there for people to see. OK, we're, we're going to call a halt there, Jenny. Just hang on one second. I've got a couple of uh, housekeeping, as it were. Um, next week, as we've already said, uh, we'll be having Graham Medley and uh, Neil Ferguson to talk specifically on the Delta variant and lockdown easing. A lot of your questions are about that. Um, send them in again for, for next week. Um, and could we get more topical? Obviously not. And on Wednesday night, um, settle down with uh, Henrietta talking to the surgeon David Knott. And finally, just to say, after that, we'll be having Simon Stevens um, on, in July. But I just want to point out for some of you who, who are big aficionados of this series, he will be on a Monday night. So that'll be Monday, July the 10th, not our usual Wednesday or Thursday. Um, but it will be his first uh, long exit interview in a, in a very long time. Um, so we're delighted he'll be joining us. So Simon will be here on July the 10th um, in his last two weeks as well, you know his job. If you don't know his job, you're not going to tune in anyway, are you? So Jenny, um, you have to go. I know you do. And there are other announcements to come today. I was hoping that had been made this morning. So you could have been a little bit more indiscreet, but sadly not. Um, we don't want you to get sacked just when you've only been there for a few weeks. That wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, it's great of you to spare the time. And, and absolutely everybody I know wishes you well in the job you're doing. And um, I do hope you get a bit of time off. I mean, <laughs> you're not going to, are you? Not for a while. I don't think so, no. <laughs> I don't think you are either. But, Thank you for the well wishes, yes. And then we will be treating you to drinks and a dinner at the RSM when you can. Okay. So pleasure. Good luck with the rest of the day. And, um, and thanks for doing this. Take care. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone else. Take care.